Hello listeners, this is John David, aka the Mafia Hairdresser. Thanks for tuning in to How I Killed My Mother. I just recorded this episode and oh, emotional toll on me, I will tell you. But you'll just have to listen. And if you haven't done so already, and whether it be on Spotify, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, YouTube, or even Audible, make sure you subscribe to How I Killed My Mother, which is the same stream as the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles on your podcast apps. And if you didn't know it, I'm the author of Mafia Hairdresser. I mention it a lot because it had a big part of my life. And um, it's a good book. Read it. Read the sequel, The Glow Stick Gods. Get it at Barnes and Noble or Amazon along with the sequel, The Glow Stick Gods. Of course, you can just scroll back in your podcast app and listen to the podcast version, which is a serial podcast, unlike this one, which is a short story nonfiction podcast. And if you want to know more about me, just go to MafiaHairdresser.com and say hi there and follow me on social. And let's start this episode, shall we? Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other True Confessions from a Mafia Hairdresser, my most personal podcast of short stories of me working out my mom issues while trying to figure out if I'm a sociopath on my way to spiritual enlightenment. Hello listeners, this is John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser. Thank you for tuning in to How I Killed My Mother. If you're just tuning in, make sure you listen to last week's podcast episode because it has set the blazing trail to find out how I killed my mother. And if you haven't done so already, and whether it be on Spotify, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, YouTube, or even Audible, make sure you subscribe to How I Killed My Mother, which is in the same stream as the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles podcast. And if you didn't know it, I'm the author of the novel Mafia Hairdresser, and the sequel, The Glow Stick Gods. Get them at Barnes & Noble or Amazon or go to MafiaHairdresser.com to check out my books and the other podcasts, such as Season 1, which is Mafia Hairdresser, and Season 2, which is The Glow Stick Gods, which if you scroll backward on your favorite podcast app, you'll see that they are part of the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles that you're listening to now. And do check out John David and Goliath, which is my five-episode podcast about when I accepted a relocation dream job at the Boca Raton Resort in Florida, only to have it turn into a nightmare job of deceit, fraud, and a billion-dollar oopsie perpetrated by the new owners. This is my most popular true crime podcast. But let's start this episode, shall we? Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Two Confessions from a Mafia Hairdresser, my most personal podcast of short stories of me working out my mom issues while trying to figure out if I'm a sociopath on the way to spiritual enlightenment. So, in last week's thrilling episode, I confessed to you how I was a horrible child, and I'm sure you can now see it was all my brother's fault. If Bubble Boy hadn't been born as sickly as he always was and insisted on hogging my mother's attention, she would have, could have, kept a more watchful eye on yours truly. And then I told you that I had been in the closet because I loved my mother and I didn't want to burst her bubble that I was never going to marry a woman. And then in the fall of my junior year in high school, my mom, Manuelita Marie Elsher, my mother, snooped and found out that I was gay. Well, immediately after she found those horrible letters from my boyfriend in my sock drawer, those love letters, those love letters that were so hot to me at the time, mom got all drama up and unbeknownst to me, sent my little brother off to a friend's house for the evening and then called my dad home early from work once again to ambush me when I got home from school. And after I drove home from school, mom and dad indeed threw down the gauntlet and it was on. A standoff, a skirmish, a family crisis, a fucking unwarranted, unprejudicial ambuscade. 
Just like when I was a child, I was once again being sat down by my parents in the living room where I was going to be told what I was going to do and how I was expected to act as well as be forced to listen to how much they were disappointed in me, which was the only part of a powwow that didn't have much of a consequence to me. As I sat down on the ottoman and faced my mom and dad propped up on the couch, I began to brace myself to listen. I wanted to find out what they were thinking. Did they find something else, such as me skipping third period that day to go to the tanning salon? Or maybe they found out that I was making fake IDs for all the underage kids and teens in the San Gabriel Valley. Or that they found out that I hung out at gay clubs in the middle of the night on the weekends. I braced myself because I always listened carefully so that I could, on the fly, come up with a lie or an excuse that would get me out of an impending, predetermined punishment. You know, at the time, I probably had about five things that were currently in play that I expected would have been the topic of our family meeting. I had two cases of beer in the trunk of my car. I had um, tried to bribe my history teacher with a free lube oil filter service at my dad's gas station for a better grade. So I forged the grade from C to a B using the school principal's Xerox machine and cutting up a friend's report card, unbeknownst to them. And instead of babysitting, I had invited about 10 friends over that very night because my parents were supposed to go to a Kiwanis dinner. But before they said anything, my mother, in a theatrical display worthy of an Oscar, hurled those touching and yet raunchy pornographic found teenage hormone-fueled letters at my face. Startlingly, it was obvious that my mother was distraught and I was shocked to see those letters, the ones that I had hid in my sock drawer. So I didn't have a split second of a clear mind to come up with any story or excuse to defend myself in regard to those letters because I was shocked and mentally off balance. My mom also began flinging words at me, vilifying accusations, charging me with crimes against God while cursing my boyfriend for his blasphemous acts against Catholic decency, as well as the desecration of my own now unpure teen boy body. Once the marbles in my head settled, for a split second, I toyed with the idea that I might be able to finagle a way out of this to make my parents think that those letters were just an elaborate prank. Like, like, oh my God, gotcha. You thought I was gay? Oh my God, please. But this was no laughter through tears moment. My mom would have never bought it. Her bullshit skills were well honed after years of dealing with my shenanigans. Admittedly, the truth about my sexuality felt like jumping without a parachute, but hey, I guess it's not like the ground was going to come any slower. I figured that there was simply no way I could postpone telling my mom that I would never marry a woman. And naively, I really thought the woman thing was the issue here. She was disappointed and boo-hoo for her, but I knew this day would come and then we'd get through it. In a short pause, in between my mom's shouting and haranguing, I interjected and I spoke up. I told both of my parents that I was gay and that I was in love with Chuck, my high school sweetheart. And then I tried to pass off the letters my boyfriend had written me as adolescent stupidity, which they were. But simple disappointment in the facts that I was never going to get married and that I was gay was not the point to my mom. You see, mom didn't see this as real or the truth, even though this time I was telling the absolute truth. And my mom would not be calmed down by, accept, or laugh off the fact that I was in love with a boy. Because that was just a symptom of a bigger problem. And that problem was that I had been psychologically manipulated by my boyfriend and therefore needed to be fixed or repaired. Both of my parents had obviously had their usual powwow because my dad just sat next to my mom and he nodded. He was going to go along with her, obviously. This whole thing became absurd to me, though. I mean, I 
I thought about both of my parents, and I thought they were very liberal. I mean, we ate Indian food. One of my mom's favorite actors was Paul Lind, you know, Uncle Arthur on Bewitched. And after all, I had an out and proud gay Uncle Joe, my mom's own brother. And I mean, he was so super gay. He was a buttless chaps wearing Folsom Street kind of gay who actually lived in San Francisco. And me and my family had met tons of his boyfriends. And then there was the fact that I had the girliest voice and it never cracked. It never changed. In fact, the last episode was the only episode where I didn't lower the pitch of that podcast. I said, F it. I'm like, this is me, girly voice and all. So anyway, my voice never changed. And to this day, I call someone on the phone who doesn't know me and they will still say, ma'am. And hey, parents, what about that time at Boy Scout camp when I walked around the whole weekend with my pant legs of my Hunter Green Steve Austin one-piece jumpsuit tucked into my knee-high moccasins? Or the time I picked out a brown sharkskin suit, a paisley shirt, and wore a neckerchief tied with a ring around my neck to my Aunt Dee's wedding and danced the mashed potato on the dance floor all night. Seriously, all of my aunts and uncles are family friends. My friends are family doctor, the mailman. They all shook their heads years later about this incident and said to me, where were your mother's eyeballs and brain? At that family meeting, both my parents flinched so many times. When I could get a word in edgewise, I tried to explain that Chuck and I were the real deal. I told them that we were in a perfectly natural relationship. As I tried to get them off the John David must be broken ledge, I remembered thinking how my dad, my boss, he was also my coworker, would certainly have come around. As I talked, I saw tears in my dad's eyes and that made me feel bad. But dad must have already known I was gay, like everyone else who had eyes and ears. And you don't think those young men at his service station didn't know? Come on. I would change my shell shirt uniform if I got a spot of oil on it from an oil change. And I cleaned my nails while I washed my hands after every car repair. Poor dad. He probably just didn't know how to talk to me about it before. I worked with him two to five days a week and full-time every summer since I was nine years old, and I don't recall ever having a personal conversation with him, not even about the birds or the bees, and certainly not about ladies. But mom would not let me sweep the heinous significance of those letters aside, nor would she let my father utter a word of support for me being gay, even if he had tried. My mom would not de-escalate the seriousness of my out-of-the-blue declaration that I was a homosexual because this was a serious catastrophe of biblical proportions. And obviously she was calling her Catholic roots, even though we had all stopped going to church a long time ago because I found out most churches' doctrines to be hypocritical and she agreed with me at the time. I did my best to cajole my mom by telling her that I was especially sorry for keeping my sexual preferences from her. I let her know that I understood that she might have been hurt that I had not come out sooner to her. I told her that I was very deeply super sorry for keeping that secret from her. I asked her to forgive me and I begged her to accept me for being me. But that did not happen. In that little meeting, my mom did not cry. She had far too much time to think about what she was going to do before that ambush. She had a plan, and she was going to stick to her plan. And my dad, having learned not to cross my mom, performed his duty to her and agreed with my mom's plan. And that plan was that my parents were going to send me to a psychologist. Oh, that was the plan? <laughs> I was only 17, but I had always sort of kind of wanted to go to a psychologist. I watched a lot of the talk shows back then, you know, Mike Douglas, Dinah Shore, and Merv Griffin. So many of the guests that I admired so much, well, they all went to psychologists. 
So it seemed kind of cool to me. But I had no idea we were all delusional about what would happen if I agreed to see a shrink. The three of us were actually setting a stage for a modern-day Shakespearean tragedy through psychology. Surprisingly to my parents, I agreed to go to a counselor, but I did put a little lima bean of a codicil in that agreement, and I got both of my parents to agree to that little P.S. That add-on to the agreement between me and my parents was that if the counselor told my mom and dad that I was normal and healthy after an agreed-upon number of sessions, then I would be able to continue to see Chuck as my boyfriend. Those were my terms. The problem for all of us was that mom was so confident that any psychologist I saw would surely see that I was broken and then inevitably be given the permission to fix me and then I would be straight once again. I don't know why my mom didn't know this at the time, but it's impossible to end gay a gay, especially this soprano. So inevitably, I was going to win this one. And that was why I agreed to, up until the counselor's diagnosis, that I would stay away from Chuck other than during high school marching band events and rehearsals. In our junior year, he played oboe and I played tenor sax. My thinking was that our period of separation was only going to be a short spell and that it would make our relationship stronger. (sighs) And yet it was going to be my mom's obsession to win a mutual propensity we both had that ended up forcing me to make several life-altering decisions that would herald years of semi-estrangement between the two of us. Finally, after two months of one-on-one sessions with a shrink, my mom, my dad, and me had my last one-on-one session time with my psychologist together. In my self-published novel based on my own life, Mafia Hairdresser, the me character, Jesse, got to pick the shrink who happened to be the uncle of his first boyfriend. I think I mentioned him in one of my last episodes, that boyfriend. Anyway, the uncle of that childhood sweetheart in that story knew about his nephew's sexuality as well as his adolescent relationship with Jesse. Jesse was able to pick the uncle as a psychologist as an ace in the hand when his parents made him go to the psychologist so he could continue seeing his current boyfriend again after those fictional sessions. But when I began to write this episode, I connected up with that first boyfriend whom the character with the shrink was based upon. I called him and told him I was going to write about him as well as his uncle that was my real life psychologist. He was like, what uncle? I don't have an uncle who is a psychologist. And I thought, oh, damn. I was going to have to go back and re-research so much of what I intended to write for this podcast. My book, Mafia Hairdresser, contained pretty much all of that bump in my relationship with my mother, minus the parts about dad, because at the time of the writing, I was mostly working out my mom issues. I still am, as you can tell, right? So, of course, also in that book, I had used plot devices and fiction to move that story along. But that book and talking about it in book signings in the 90s must have muddled up what was real about the non-fictional time in my life when my own mother made me go to the psychologist. So, dear listener, I'm doing the best I can here to tell you the absolute truth, but one must realize that memories are like copies of copies, and truth to me, as I have stated, has always been a challenge. Another by the way, yes, I added a Y and appropriated my brother's name, Jess, for my fictional account of me in that Mafia Hairdresser Time of My Life, that book. I already told you I was the kind of child to take what I wanted, and some habits are hard to break. So the real story was that I had no ace in the hole where the shrink was concerned. He must have come out of the phone book or was a member of the Kiwanis or something, but it didn't matter. He was a qualified and a good psychologist. And just like in my novel, he did inform my parents in our last session that I was undeniably in a healthy relationship with another boy, despite what my mom thought about those nasty love letters being passed between us boyfriends. So yay, 
the shrink declared to my parents that I was a healthy homo. And then he stated the obvious, that my parents were still my parents and that I was still shy of 18 years of age. So that meant legally that they had every right to control whom I could spend time with. But I wasn't worried. That was a technicality to me. We were all practically adults, and the fam had made an agreement with each other. When I left the psychologist's office that day, that last session with my parents in the room, I believed my rents were going to honor the agreement with me. Without a doubt in my mind, they were going to let me and Chuck continue our relationship, and they were going to accept me and Chuck as boyfriends. Gay boyfriends. In the car on the way home, I quickly realized that my mom felt completely humiliated again by me. And she was vastly caught off guard because things did not go the way she was certain they should have gone. My mother was also seething. From the passenger seat, my tiny mighty mom began pounding her fists on the dashboard of the car and ranting verbally about her assessment of our last psychology session together, such as, without a shadow of a doubt, that the counselor was most definitely a homo himself. In fact, mom rhetorically asked me if the psychologist had ever touched me inappropriately in the same sentence that she informed me that I was a confused heterosexual boy misled by a vile, devil-possessed, horny 17-year-old sexual deviant. I'd never seen my mom so mad or Catholic. Honestly, she scared me. Dad was scared too, as well. And instead of nodding and agreeing with her, he just checked out. Dad became unresponsive. His catatonic reaction to my mom's rage made me realize that dad was not going to be of any measurable help in my current sitch. He was most certainly freaked out and he would most certainly go along with whatever his wife was fervently and currently plotting to do to me. All the way home, mom screamed on about the incompetent and probably homosexual pervert psychologist and how my time and sessions with him were the worst waste of time and rape of their money and rape of me. Ugh, it was gross. Now look at the mess we're in, she screamed at the windshield. Um, me? I sat cowering in the back seat while strategizing how I was going to deal with my mother. I was listening for it, but she was not immediately offering any new sort of plan. Not just yet, anyway. But when she did come up with a plan, hopefully by the time we got home, so I could hear it, then I could make up my own anti-plan. While I listened from my backseat stillness, I was also processing what was actually going down. I was forced to mentally let go of the all too hopeful dream that my mom was going to honor her part in our agreement and accept me and Chuck. And she was never going to allow me and Chuck to begin seeing each other ever again. And yet I was praying in the back bucket seat of my parents' family style Ford Econoline van that my mom was only just venting. Maybe she was just at her wit's end after a lifetime dealing with an obstinate asshole of a son who seemed to get everything he wanted. And then once again, I had won. I had won because the shrink said I was okay. The shrink agreed that I was a normal gay boy. So I was supposed to be able to see Chuck again as my boyfriend. I won the original agreement as if it was another power play war game of wits between us. Like when I was a gaslighting, lying little kid. But mom wasn't ready to concede that I won this war. So the shots and shells kept flying. On that drive home, mom was forming an idea that would have actually harmed me, mentally and physically. It was something that was going to be her new plan and should never have happened. At first, she brought up the idea of going to another psychologist or a psychiatrist so he could prescribe de-gayifying drugs. If cell phones were around at that time, she would have been Googling drugs that cure homosexuals. Military school also came up on that drive home, and she mentioned to no one in particular in the car that she had read somewhere that there were camps in the woods that taught boys how to be men. 
But then she came up with the bad solution, the new plan. If I had a weak heart, that plan my mom came up with could have caused a heart attack and shook my soul from my body. Mom came up with the idea that shock treatments would be the perfect reset for my confused, sick, and badly functioning brain. This was 1977, and at the time, folks, there were gays being subjected to shock treatments to turn them straight. Shocking. Shocking, right? But that plan was the one, the one idea and plan that seemed to calm my mom down the most on that fate-wrenching car ride home from the shrink. Oh yeah, when my mom came up with the shock treatment plan, she didn't let go of that medical quackery stream of thinking for the entire rest of the way home. She actually began to make an out loud list in her head of all the steps she was going to have to take to find out where they had such treatments, as well as how much of their savings they were going to have to use to have to pay for those electrically powered sessions once we got home. To mom, shock treatments for me seemed the best resolution for our situation. Listening to my mom in the car on the way home made me realize that I could very well be in a heap of mortal danger. At the very least, I was asleep and nightmaring after reading a Dickens novel. But mom was going to get me back for all of those years of being bad, for all of the lies, for all of the gaslighting I inflicted on her. And I went from being scared to being terrified. We were a revenge family. Well, she and I were. My mom was going to make sure that I suffered as much as I made her suffer since I was born. I had pushed her buttons to the edge of sanity all my life, and now I was going to pay for that with a rag in my mouth and bolts of direct current into my brain. But let me tell you what my fear did for me that day. It made me make one of the first adult life decisions that I have ever made for myself. It's one of those decisions I deeply regret today, But I was young, and I was working with a 17-year-old boy brain, so give me a break. That day, I remember looking at my dad, thinking how small and pushed aside he was in the situation. I don't think he gave a flying fuck if I was gay. But because his wife was stronger and pushier, he was just going to let whatever she decided rule. I decided he was weak. But that was only part of the life decision I made. And then from the back of the seat of the family Ford Econoline van, I looked at my mom. She was the ruler, the one who made the rules, the winner at all cost head of the family. I decided that from that day on, I was going to be a ruler as well, not the ruled, and certainly not weak or anything like my father. From that day forward, In my mind, there were only two kinds of people, and I chose to be like my mother. I would be a winner at all costs. And that black and white assessment of people and how I looked at the world became my excuse to put aside other people's feelings and put my needs above all else in the quest to always win and to be the ruler, the winner. I thought I could become what I thought the essence of my mother was at the time, or I was going to be less than. My parents renege, and my fear of shock treatments gave me the self-permission to use all of my lying, my backtracking, my gaslighting, and my manipulation skills that I had nurtured in myself growing up. That life decision impelled me to act in self-preservation and use whatever tools, strengths, or defenses I was gifted with to get whatever I wanted in life. So I became a pushy asshole for the next fucking 30 years. Of course I blame my mother for everything that I became after that. I blame her for what I am. And I'm okay that she probably blames me from heaven or the next dimension for turning into whomever she became and was and is. And she knows I'm sorry. And I would have done so many things differently as a child or as a teen or as an adult if I had known there was really such a thing as karma. And yet she'd probably not be sorry at all for anything she ever did to me. 
She's probably laughing at me right now for what I'm laying down here because I ignorantly think it's funny, illuminating, cleansing, or cathartic. Once all three of us got home and mom seemingly chilled down, I took advantage of the calm and I asked my parents to sit down so I could talk to them. I told them that on the way home, I had an epiphany. Of course, I didn't. But I really wanted them to hear what I thought they wanted to hear. And because I knew where it concerned most parents, even my parents, they tended to believe what they want to believe as far as their visions and projections onto their lying children. Like the time I came home after smoking pot at my friend Andrea's house when her parents weren't home. My mom instantly smelled something on me the minute I walked in the door. What's that smell? She asked accusingly. Like, uh, what smell? I asked as I backed away. Then I stood up straight and shrugged my shoulders indignantly, as if to counter-accuse, as if the smell was on her. That herbal smell, she said. She wrinkled her nose. I was at Andrea's, yeah. So, said my mom, folding her arms. So, she lives in the middle of a nursery, I said. And that was true. I said, dude, there are like all kinds of herbs and everything around our house. We always totally reek whenever we go there. And my mom kind of pondered that. And she goes, oh, yes, that makes sense. And then I said, I'm going to bed. Wait, she said, why are your eyes red? Oh, because I went swimming in Andrea's gnarly pool. Chlorine, you know, not gnarly. Then why is your hair dry? Oh, because I didn't get my head in water. Guy. (laughs) And my mom said, oh, okay, good night then. And I said, good night, mom. So you get it. And mom, if you're listening, you could be so gullible sometimes. You made it so easy for me to lie. That's on you. Anyhow, since I only had a short period of time in the car to think about how I was going to get around my mother and her new plan to alter my brain waves, I figured I'd just let her think that I would simply go back to being the boy she thought I was after she found out that I was a homosexualist. It was a long shot, frankly. My counter plan wasn't going to be easy, even if I was going to give them what they wanted to hear. But I had a hunch that I could make my mom and dad think that I was determined to be straight again because that is what mom wanted so badly. I admitted to them, maybe, no, most certainly, that I was indeed simply confused. I also told them that the whole counselor thing really opened my eyes and that I decided that I was going to have to take charge of my life like a man. I just needed to plant my feet firmly in the ground, move forward, and grow out of my homo phase. I felt that I could just jettison my dirty homo stuff out of my head when I put my mind to it. As I began to weave the lie about returning to straight, I knew that I would have to also add a deflective piece of truth to the story so that they would more tend to believe me. My parents had always heard me say that I wanted to be an airline pilot while growing up. We had a family friend, Roger, who was an international Pan Am pilot. He was a cool dude, tall and handsome. Roger had a beautiful wife and a perfect daughter who was my babysitter when I was in preschool and kindergarten. I remember I actually wanted to be him when I grew up, and my parents also remembered me saying that. My parents also knew that when I set my sights on something, I usually always achieved it. So when I told them that I decided that I was going to be an airline pilot, something I had many times said before, and they wanted for me, they believed me. And somehow, in telling them that I wanted to be an airline pilot like Roger, I was also able to convey that I thought that there was no such thing as gay airline pilots. And since that was a career that I wanted more than anything else in the world, that I would most certainly have to date girls again to be an airline pilot. And they believed that I believed that. So therefore, they also believed that I was going to be straight again. 
So quick, Dungamont, no shock treatments, thankfully. And soon, life in the Marie Elsher household began to feel and look like it had before Mom unraveled my socks, my life, and my truth. My lie about being straight worked. And since my parents both lied to me when they said they'd let me and Chuck be together after the psychologist cleared me for mental health, I continued to lie to them. Tit for tat, every day I lied. I continued to see Chuck. I would tell my parents I was going to be with someone else whenever I was with Chuck. Sometimes he even snuck into my room to spend the night, and I occasionally snuck in and slept over at his parents' house as well. We spent random weekends together and were inseparable after school and on days that I didn't work. And when I graduated, I actually enrolled at Mount San Antonio College to become an airline pilot the same year Chuck moved 40 miles south after he enrolled in Long Beach State. I lied to my parents every day from the middle of my junior year in high school, my senior year, and my first year of college, and into the first few months of beauty school. I thought I was being a winner, a ruler. I was still seeing Chuck, and I was still living under my parents' roof to save as much money as I could while I still worked at my dad's gas stations and went to school. But I wasn't a ruler and I wasn't a winner. That was a lie I told myself. Yes, I even lied to myself. In fact, I actually thought I wanted to be an airline pilot when that was just part of a convincing story that over time I had convinced myself was real. Much like how my based on nonfiction novel Mafia Hairdresser changed some facts in my head, I thought I was being a triumphant human being, but I had just really become the biggest liar. Let me go on with this train of thought. I thought I was being the ruler and the winner because I resumed my relationship with Chuck under my parents' very nose, but I was a loser because I was not living my truth. If I were truly the winner, or a winner after my mom made me go to the psychologist, I would have made her accept who I was. I wouldn't have stopped until she did. For her own good, for myself, for each other. I should have faced her every day, proudly or defiantly, and I would have made her see that she was wrong to denounce me for being gay. You can't be a ruler or a winner when the people or the parents you're fooling don't fully see that they are being ruled or have lost anything. I was just lying. But as you know, dear listeners, lies don't stay lies forever. And when my mom found out that I had lied to her throughout the rest of my junior year, my senior year, as well as all through my first year of college and into beauty school, she got all drama up again. Only this time, she had a thermal nuclear meltdown. She even ordered dad to use a shotgun on my boyfriend. But that is a story for the next episode. Before I say adieu, I want to tell you that I have grown into a a very nice person. A good person. I don't lie much. And I do not manipulate people or situations to get my way anymore. Those childhood decisions I made for myself were born out of fear and anger that I had to work hard to grow out of. I did a lot of work on myself, and I've had to ask myself, was it even possible that I could have not lied or acted out of fear or greed or meanness in the family situations I've told you about? Could I have made decisions or done actions based out of love rather than selfishness or manipulation? And would I have had as much fun being kind rather than being a bully in my younger years? Would I have had the fantastic experience I have had if I had leaned into the golden rule or my spiritual nature rather than the kind of person who cut people up or out of my life if they got in my way? Hmm. Anyway, who the fuck cares? Life's too short for bad drama and even worse disguises of enlightenment. And this is not a self-help podcast. This is an all about me and my mother podcast, so get your own. In the next episode of How I Killed My Mother, I'm going to tell you about the day my mother found out I lied to her and how she made dad get the shotgun to shoot my boyfriend. So onward.